And showtime, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Channel Pro 5-Minute Roundup, a look at news, trends, and tips for the SMB channel in five minutes or thereabouts. My name is Rich Freeman. I am executive editor of the Channel Pro Network. I'm also one of your hosts on the program here. I am joined this and every week by your other host, Eric Simpson, a business transformation and improvement consultant for MSPs and other IT providers. Eric, how you doing this week? Doing better this week, Rich. It's uh, a little more temperate here in Southern California. And uh, I think, you know, most of what was going to be burned up uh, has been burned up. I think there's still some wildfires going on, but I think we're a little more out of the woods this week than we were last week. You know what? Uh, normally this time of year in Seattle, if it, if it rains, we feel like we're sort of missing out on some of that uh, late summer weather. But uh, the rain that has come here recently washed away all that smoke. Uh, so I can breathe again. Thumbs up on the ring. Looking, looking good here, too. Well, let's uh, dive into this week's story uh, here. It's kind of a sign of the time story and con uh, concerns Beachhead Solutions. Um, and uh, on its own, uh, you know, maybe not an earth shattering story, but definitely an interesting one in terms of where the industry is going. So, so what happened here? Beachhead makes a product called Simply Secure uh, that MSPs can use to protect laptops and uh, other mobile devices. And, and, you know, basically you can quarantine or even um, shut down, kill um, the devices if they trigger um, certain conditions, if, you know, uh, and it's up to you how you set this, but 10 bad login attempts. Uh, somebody who hasn't logged in in 90 days is suddenly back trying to get on the network and so on. So interesting security solution. Up until this point in time, um, it has actually been written into their license agreement, into the contract, that only the MSP is allowed to uh, access the solution, use, uh, get into the interface, um, manipulate the settings, etc. And the thinking behind that basically was there are SMBs out there where, you know, the receptionist is also doubling as the IT person. And, you know, we don't want to take the chance that somebody is going to um, configure it improperly, do something accidentally that maybe lowers their security guard, uh, if you will. So if you were uh, a, a Beachhead Solutions partner, you had to agree going in, only you as the MSP were uh, going to have access to the system. Well, lo and behold, um, the co-managed IT model um, over the course of the last 12 months or so really has been taking off uh, in the world of, of managed services. And more and more MSPs are finding that there is um, good business to be had um, entering into that kind of a relationship, typically with a larger, like a, a mid-sized business, maybe a business large enough to have its own IT department. And there, there are different models, different ways that uh, MSPs do this, but typically what they'll do is extend their tool set to this uh, customer's IT department. On a day-to-day -day basis, the customer is actually kind of managing the network and the endpoints. And they have the MSP to draw on if they need assistance with something, if they need to escalate something. Typically how a, a co-managed deal would work. Well, obviously in that situation, the people who would potentially be using Simply Secure have IT skills. They can probably be trusted uh, to use that particular tool. And, and they want to do that. It makes sense from the end user standpoint and for the, uh, from the MSP standpoint to enable that. And so a lot of input coming into Beachhead. We're doing co-managed IT. It would really be great if we had the ability to do that without violating the contract. And uh, Beachhead went ahead and they made that change. It, it's, it's interesting. There's actually no, um, no new coding, no functionality change. The ability theoretically to do this was there in the past. It was the license agreement that prevented people from doing it. And so um, Beachhead has updated the, uh, the contract. Um, if you uh, uh, amend the contract you have now or, or you become a new partner down the road, you will have um, under certain circumstances, the rights to enable your co-managed IT client to do certain functions within the system. There are still some things that are restricted to the MSP for the good of the end user, but the product is now much more co-managed IT friendly and I call it a sign of the times, Eric, because like I said, the co-managed IT model really is um, taking off in managed services. Uh, now, I've, I've been hearing about it uh, more and more in the last 12 months, and particularly in the last six months um, since uh, COVID-19, there are a lot of uh, IT departments out there, who, you know, overwhelmed with work from home, uh, uh, workloads not very experienced, maybe managing uh, remote workers, which is, you know, something MSPs know all about. So there are bigger businesses contracting with MSPs these days. I only expect co-managed IT to get hotter, and I only expect to see more vendors do what Beachhead has done 
and make changes, whether it's to the, the license agreement or to the actual product itself, to better support that co-managed uh, kind of scenario, because there's a lot of it going on and there's more coming. Yeah, Rich, and we've covered, <clears throat> you know, and talked about the co-managed evolution, as it were, and how, you know, the, the, the pandemic has actually accelerated this uh, by offering uh, MSPs opportunities in, in larger corporate environments where, you know, the internal IT department was just not ready to, you know, <laughs> support and migrate a bunch of work from home workforces. Uh, and so these, these MSPs now that may have attempted to present their services to them in the past and have been, you know, turned away suddenly, you know, have become, you know, lifesavers to some of these organizations. So, yeah, I certainly believe that now that, you know, just like, you know, having virtual meetings has become more of the norm for businesses, having co-managed IT and seeing the value of that, clearing the noise so that, you know, that, that costly and probably highly stressed internal IT department can focus on more strategic initiatives. Um, you know, by, by engaging with an MSP looks a lot uh, more approachable nowadays. And, and I'll say good on, uh, you know, uh, good on the team for, for enabling this functionality because, you know, as you and I well know, Rich, it, it, sometimes it's tough to get a vendor to, to make, you know, just even a, a simple change that will benefit so many others, uh, you know, in, in the industry. And we can only hope that, you know, as you say, other vendors take note and uh, make it as easy uh, as, as it has been here to, to listen to, to partners and, and kind of do the right thing to help them grow their businesses. Yeah, I, I definitely predict that there, there are gonna be more stories coming in the next six to 12 months about vendors um, making their products more co-managed IT friendly. It's a, it's a big enough phenomenon and, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's got enough traction. I, I think we're going to see a lot, uh, a lot more of that coming up in the future. Um, so co-managed IT and, and some of the challenges associated with that, um, that's, that's certainly something that uh, has changed, is new in the world of managed services right now. Um, but also the way that um, MSPs and other IT providers meet with their clients, talk to their clients have changed, obviously, um, in the, the work from home and uh, a pandemic kind of era. And that has some implications for uh, some of the documents uh, and information that they share with clients, which is your uh, tip of the week uh, this week, Eric. Absolutely, Rach. I think we should, you know, I'm thinking we should start putting out some t-shirts, you know, that say thanks COVID because it's kind of, you know, it, 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 it's bittersweet, right? It's such a horrible, horrible pandemic that's impacted so many people, but it has forced uh, organizations to th rethink how they operate and what they accept as being, you know, acceptable before, you know, maybe folks didn't want to do conference calls to have strategic meetings or didn't want to have virtual calls and forced everybody to come in and do these mandatory meetings. Well, you know, everyone has been forced to adopt and adapt uh, to the new virtual now. And as we've covered on, on uh, you know, the show before, um, more, more uh, businesses are, are open to using tools like Zoom and Teams to have virtual meetings and collaboration uh, internally, as well as to accept, you know, sales appointments now and working with partners to, to hone those skills, to, to use the platform and not make it awkward to deliver what traditionally was done potentially in person. And so the tip of the week this week, really, Rich, is to adapt all of your processes to support and leverage these tools in ways that um, are more strategic, right? So if we're delivering QBRs to existing clients, adapt that delivery to make it more visual, right? Leverage the platform to do more desktop sharing to, and not to just go through a paper report that you might have done kneecap to kneecap with a client uh, in the old days, but, you know, really focus on maybe creating a PowerPoint presentation for the QBR, maybe delivering it that way, making it more visually interesting. And same thing with sales uh, presentations. Don't just, you know, use the tool and do it the same way you did before. You have a new tool with new functionality and, and, and more power to build a story to generate emotion. So, you know, leverage the ability for the platform to do those things with, you know, more visual activity, even playing short testimonial uh, videos of clients and things like that. So, you know, push the envelope 
in leveraging these tools and create distinction and differentiation again between you and your competitors, you know, especially from a sales perspective. And you know, deliver those uh, sessions more efficiently, um, you know, because uh, sitting in a lobby waiting for somebody to get done when they've got a you know, scheduled Zoom call, I find that people are more on time for these kinds of calls than other things. So um, take advantage, adapt, and, and thrive. And I think it's really great uh, advice, Eric. And I, I mean, you know, even from a channel pro uh, perspective, I, I can uh, uh, relate to that because, you know, we, we do conferences and, and ordinarily those would be in-person face-to-face kinds of conferences that, you know, this year we're, we're having to do uh, some that we would otherwise do in person online. And it's a very similar kind of thing. You know, you just have to um, instead of just taking something that you develop to deliver in a hotel ballroom somewhere and doing it on the internet instead, you really do have to kind of think about um, the audience experience online and the, the capabilities of the tools that you're dealing with and adapt to that. Take advantage of capabilities that you don't necessarily have when you're doing something in person and, um, and correct for things that maybe don't translate well from a face-to-face -face environment to an online environment. Same exact thing goes to any meeting that you have with one of your clients. Um, that there are things that Zoom or, or Teams can do that um, you should be taking advantage of. And there are things that if you, you know, you, you try to recreate in a virtual meeting just won't work as well. It's a different experience. And you, you, you need to kind of, you know, based on your own uh, experiences in meetings like that and what you've seen work and, and what doesn't work and uh, what engages people and what doesn't, you have to kind of adapt how you uh, meet with, present to, speak with, uh, with customers in, in, uh, in those settings. Right, Rich, and you, and you touched on, you know, something that we're see, starting to see gain a lot of traction as well as that, that customer experience, that CX, right, kind of like user experience, but that CX, that customer experience, that event experience, whatever it is, you know, has to be engaging, right? It's different reading a book than watching a movie, right? It's, it's so it's, you know, you have to use, you have to adapt to, to the environment and to the audience, like you said uh, uh, very well there. Well, uh, that leaves us time with just one more story or time for more, just one more story this week. And, uh, you know, I, I could either kind of set this up, Eric, as an example of something not to do uh, with some of these video conferencing platforms or as an example of something that was brilliantly conceived but uh, foiled somehow uh, in the process. Here, here's basically what happened. There's a, a congresswoman from Mexico City uh, participating in a rather large Zoom meeting uh, and uh, she was caught basically um, skipping out of the meeting. The, the reason she got caught is people could see her leaving the room and leaving behind a picture of herself looking into the camera there. If, if, uh, if she had somehow managed to maybe slip under the desk or something or get out of there, she, she might have gotten away with this photograph staring into the camera for the rest of the meeting. And as long as nobody asks her a question, maybe nobody notices that she's not actually there anymore. You know, I, I think a lot of us maybe are, are uh, dealing with a certain amount of Zoom fatigue and, and Teams fatigue. Again, I'm, I'm not sure, was, was this genius a, a way to kind of get out uh, of, of one or more of those meetings? Or was this maybe something to just not really kind of try to uh, duplicate yourself? Yeah, it, either it was uh, brilliantly planned, but, you know, failed in execution miserably, or, you know, she, her, she claims that, you know, I'm really not familiar with the platform. I don't know how it kind of took a picture of me and made it my background. And I, I was there, I, you know, so who knows, but, you know, in, in the, in the world of, of Zoom uh, fail meeting stories, this is rather one of the tamer ones that I've seen, Rich. So, uh, you know, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good point. Good point. This, this was uh, safe for use on this broadcast as a result. Uh, well, uh, as I say all the time we've got uh, for you this week, thank you so much for joining us on the show. If you uh, like the five minute round, if you want to maybe take a look at some episodes you didn't see in the past, keep up with the new ones as they become available. Best thing to do is go to the Channel Pro Network channel on YouTube and subscribe to that. Uh, make sure you click that little bell icon if you want to get notified when new episodes go up. Um, you want to read more about Beachhead Solutions, you want to get uh, great business growth advice for your company, all sorts of other terrific resources, uh, please go to channelpronetwork.com every day because we have got great new stuff going up for you there on a daily basis. To learn more about Eric and the work that he does with his clients, your destination should be ericsimpson.com. That is E-R-I-C-K-Simpson.com. 
Uh, so um, we thank you very much for joining us. We're going to be back again next week with another episode of the show. Until then, folks, please enjoy the rest of your week. Eric and I are enjoying the rest of your week already. <laughs>